As tonight's celebration continues, we're also going to spend a few minutes hearing about the amazing advancements in cancer research taking place right here in Portland, Oregon at the Providence Cancer Institute. Please join me right now in welcoming Dr. Walter Erba to the stage. Dr. Erba, welcome to the main stage here this thank, evening. Thank you, Drew, and uh, thank you to everyone joining from home tonight. I would like to echo uh, John's comments before about how much we wanted to be here in person. We were so close to being able to gather in person, uh, uh, but um, we tried very hard, but because it, is, because it had been so long since we have been together. However, your safety and the safety of those who care for our patients is very important to us. So we pivoted to a virtual event, which I hope you'll enjoy tonight. Thank you for tuning in from home for this special evening. Your support, as you heard, is crucial to the research we do at Providence. And I'd like to thank those of you who have already made them gifts tonight. I wanna to give a special thank you to our Creating Hope Committee, which was led by my former patient, Rebecca Armstrong, for all their work in planning tonight's event. Special thanks as well to our Cancer Leadership Cabinet and our Providence Portland Medical Foundation Board of Directors for their support. In just a minute, I'm going to invite Dr. Eric Tran to join me on the stage to talk a bit about the innovative research he is leading in the Child's Research Institute. But first, I would like to introduce you to his former mentor, Dr. Steven Rosenberg, who was also mentored to our own Dr. Bernard Fox. Dr. Rosenberg is known worldwide as a pioneer leader in the field of cancer immunotherapy, the science of leveraging the body's immune system to eradicate cancer. He has received the highest awards from our international societies for both clinical and basic cancer research. So Dr. Rosenberg is a big deal in our field. And I'd like you to hear what he had to say when he began his lecture that he delivered virtually at Providence just a few weeks ago. Eric especially has played such a seminal role in the development of uh, many of our modern efforts, as you'll see as I give this uh, talk. Eric came to the uh, surgery branch uh, in 2010. We spent six wonderful years uh, working, uh, working together. Eric is a brilliant scientist, uh, one of the smartest fellows that I've had over these uh, 40 plus years. Uh, and a particular pleasure then to be able to present this and present some of his work as well, as you'll see. Almost exactly 20 years earlier, Bernie Fox came to the surgery branch in 1985 and spent five years working with us and made uh, important contributions. Uh, I almost feel like I'm coming home to Providence uh, because of uh, all the many friends that I, uh, that I have. High praise from an icon in our field. Eric must make you feel very good. Um, uh, Dr. Tran joined our team in 2017. He could have gone just about anywhere to conduct his research, and we are incredibly grateful that he chose Providence, just as we are grateful that our colleague, Dr. Fox, made that same choice some 25 or so years ago. Dr. Tran, we are thrilled to uh, have you on the Providence team, and I'm excited to have a moment to talk to you tonight about your research. It's wonderful to be here and an honor to be featured at this event. Thank you for having me. So, uh, you think your, your lab focuses on something called adoptive immunotherapy, which not everyone is familiar with. We heard Drew talk a little bit about it earlier tonight. For those who are watching tonight who are not scientists, what, what, what does this mean? So adoptive cell therapy is one type of immunotherapy that directly harnesses an immune cell in your body called the T cell. And so we all have billions and billions of T cells in our bodies. Um, and the main purpose of T cells is to keep us safe from things like bacteria and viruses. Um, the reason why researchers like myself are interested in T cells is because it turns out that some T cells can specifically target and kill cancer cells. And so in adoptive cell therapy, we try to directly harness these T cells by taking T cells from a patient, taking those T cells in the lab, growing them up to high numbers, typically in the billions and billions, and then reinfusing those T cells back into the patient with the hope and expectation that this army of T cells can now home into the tumor and destroy the cancer. And as a physician who takes care of patients, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see it when the right T cell gets in the right patient and makes the tumor go away. It's a great outcome for all involved. Now, it doesn't work as often as we'd like it to. Can you talk a little bit about the work that your lab is doing to try and improve the effectiveness of T-cell therapy? Sure, so broadly speaking, there are 
two different types of adopt-to-sell therapy. And so in the first approach, which I'll call the first generation adopt-to-sell therapy approach, uh, which was mentored by Dr. Steve Rosenberg, um, a tumor is extracted, uh, removed from a patient. That tumor is taken to the lab. And then the T cells within the tumors are amplified and expanded, typically to the billions. And then those are reinfused back into the patient. And so the idea behind this approach is quite simple. It's that um, if you can, some of those T cells in the tumor are there because they're recognizing the tumors and trying to kill the tumor, but for some reason, um, they're losing the battle, so to speak. And so if we can amplify those tumor reactive T cells to the billions and reinfuse those back in the, into the patient, then hopefully that can eradicate the tumors. So in the setting of metastatic melanoma, which is the deadliest form of skin cancer, um, this sort of therapy could be curative in about 20 to 25% of patients. And when it worked, um, it was quite remarkable. Um, I remember a patient with melanoma the size of a football on the back of his neck. And after infusion of these T cells, that tumor essentially melted away. And so we learned that T cells could be extremely powerful weapons against cancer. Um, the fact that 20 to 25% of patients are cured means that, well, most of the patients are not cured. And in fact, when you try this therapy in other types of cancers, uh, common cancers like colorectal cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancers, and others, it's actually not as effective. And so this is where the second generation or the second approach of adopt the cell therapy comes in. This is the approach that my lab is pursuing right now. And it involves gene engineering techniques to enhance cell therapy and overcome some of the limitations of the first generation first generation approach. And so you remember in the first generation approach, uh, we took the T cells that were inside the tumor. And so those T cells have been there probably a long time, probably months to years, um, fighting the battle and losing. And so they're probably exhausted and, and older T cells that are just not going to be effective. And so in the second generation approach that we're pursuing, um, instead of using the T cells in the tumor, what we, tr what we do is essentially take T cells from the peripheral blood of the patient. And so within the blood of patients, there are T cells that are not as exhausted. They're younger, more fit, and potentially more effective. And so then we use gene engineering to insert a receptor into these blood T cells, which will redirect those T cells now to target the cancer cells. Um, and so in this way that we can overcome the limitation of the first generation approach. And so this gene engineered therapy is what my lab is working on right now. And we're only one of a few labs in the world that are doing this sorts of therapy. Sounds great, important work for our patients. Also sounds expensive. Yeah. And, then, and, I, and I, I know the limits to what we can do with grant money and federal support. And so maybe you can tell us what role philanthropy has played in, in, in your research. Yes. So simply put, uh, philanthropy is essential for the research that I do. Um, as I've described and as one might appreciate, what I've told you is a very highly personalized approach. The therapy that we generate is just for that individual patient. It's not something where we can take off the shelf, treat thousands of patients with. It's actually unique to that individual and it requires specialized facilities. So we need a clean room facility to do this. We need special equipment. We need special um, materials in order to generate these uh, therapies for patients. On top of that, um, because these are highly experimental therapies um, that are not FDA approved drugs yet, um, that means that health insurance does not cover any aspect of this treatment. And so with that, essentially, these are exper uh, ex expensive experiments that do require a lot of funding. And without philanthropy, I don't think it can happen. And so with that, certainly, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thank you to those that have supported our research. Thank you to those watching, and also thanks to those in the future that will support our research. It's really only with this support that we can develop the medicines of tomorrow. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And this, this, the, the funds from tonight will go to support this great work that you've heard. Um, appreciate your taking the time to uh, uh, talk about your work and share it with our Creating Hope guests. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, it's my hope that our research will be able to lead to better outcomes for these patients um, and give them more time with friends and family. And um, in fact, we actually have a patient uh, with metastatic pancreatic cancer where we were somewhat successful 
Um, and this patient's name is Kathy, and uh, here is her story. <laughs> 